On behalf of Lewis Lawton Health System and LSU Health, I'd like to welcome you here today. As always, it is a privilege for Willis Knighton to be part of the medical team providing life-changing health care to children like Mufasa. Joining us today also is Dr. Mark Banks, an anesthesiologist who will be part of tomorrow's team. And I will let Lisa introduce to the rest of the team. Thank you. This really is an astounding um, procedure to have here in our community and the fact that we have, we're having multiple organizations come together as you know from the press release this um, involves the Palestinian Relief Fund uh, working with LSU Health Sciences Center as an academic medical center as well as Willis Knighton Health System so this is not an easy thing to accomplish but as you can tell from this very handsome young man that we have here with us today it is certainly an endeavor that is worth everything that's going into us so at this point in time, I'm going to ask Dr. G. E. Golly, who will be the lead surgeon on this, to come forward and introduce the team and help you better understand what's involved in this very complex procedure. But again, thank you all so much for coming out today. This is not the uh, first time that uh, the that, uh, Wilson Health System, along with LSU Health, uh, as well as the Palestinian Relief Fund, have come together to uh, help uh, the, the little child. And uh, today we have Mustafa here, who is uh, from uh, from Palestine, and he has a uh, a fairly rare condition uh, that uh, involves a cleft uh, of really his entire face, uh, all the way up to between his eye sockets, uh, between his uh, the orbits. Uh, but we have Dr. Matoriani, who is uh, the uh, lead uh, pediatric uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, uh, taking care of Mustafa. We have Chris Scalia here. You met Dr. Bank before. And, uh, and, we, and really, uh, it, this is sort of a combined effort. Uh, not everybody that will be involved in the surgery is here today. It involves uh, uh, everyone from the radiology department to uh, uh, certainly uh, the intensive care unit, the pharmacy, the blood bank, and, and, and many, many others that will be taken care of. Of, of this young man uh, uh, post-operatively as well. So Mustafa's condition uh, is really a rare um, condition that uh, is involved in the development of the face and, and the forebrain of the, uh, of the brain and the skull area. And basically uh, it's a result of these areas failing to fuse properly uh, during uh, embryologic development. One of the things that happens is that the eye sockets end up being very wide apart and there tends to be a cleft, uh, like you would see in a typical cleft lip, but it actually go, it includes the lip and, and the nose and all the way between the eye sockets, sometimes even all the way up to the, to the base of the skull, up, up to the brain area. So that cleft runs from here all the way up to the forehead region that you can see here. So as a result of this cleft, uh, one of the things that's happened is, is that the eye sockets are wide. That's a condition called hypertillerism. So in between that, there's this abnormal bone that you see here that I kind of have hashtag. That bone that, that's hashtag. So the operation is going to really involve, I'm going to put the skull back on. This is the part that Dr. Notoriani is going to take off for us. What we do here is we make an incision that goes from one ear to the other and that allows us to peel the scalp forwards and to peel the scalp backwards, so it exposes the skull. At that time, we'll, uh, Dr. Notoriani will do what's called a bifrontal craniotomy, which are making these little holes here and taking this piece of bone off. We'll ultimately put this piece back on at the end of the surgery. But this piece comes off, and then that will give us access to where the top part of the eye sockets are portions of the eye sockets that are inside the brain. So Dr. Antonio will also put a little spinal drain in to drain off some of this cerebral spinal fluid to allow a little bit of relaxation of the brain so that we'll retract the brain out of the way and we'll able, be able to make these cuts. All these cuts will result in us being able to take the eye socket on each side and independently move the eye sockets closer together. To get them closer together, we've got to be able to access inside the brain that's the importance of being able to get in there neurosurgically and, and then remove this intervening bone. Once the intervening bone is removed, 
then we're able to mobilize the eye sockets and bring them closer together. And then we stabilize them in position using plates and screws. Some may have titanium, some may be dissolvable. <clears throat> Once we've done that, then we'll address or take care of some of the external features of this condition, uh, which includes uh, uh, some of the clefting that you see on the outside. Now, when Mustafa was a child, right? <laughs> now he's a young man. When, when he was a child, he had his the lip, the lip part repaired. Uh, originally, the cleft went through the lip as well. So what we'll do this at this point is when we get the eye sockets together and then put everything back, put the scalp back, and look at everything, we'll then make some corrections to get his nose repaired. So the idea will be to fix his nose tomorrow at the same time. <laughs> Once Mustafa goes to sleep, we will have the pediatric surgeons put some lines in him, and then um, before we get started, I'll put a small drain in the low part of his back. And then um, when we actually start the case and have the skull exposed, when we're making our bony cuts, we'll have the anesthesiologist open that drain, and that will let some spinal fluid off, and this will um, allow the brain to itself to, to relax. We won't actually be working in the brain. Luckily, there's a nice lining outside of the brain, and so this will allow that lump, the brain and the lining to kind of retract, which will allow them more room at the skull base from above, so they can see from above, and then they'll be able to see from below as well to take out any bone um, that's needed to make the repair. So that's pretty much what we'll be doing, and then we'll plate everything back down once we're, once we're finished. Now what's the recovery time for something like this? Well, he'll be in the ICU for a few days, um, and then hopefully out to the floor, and we'll be monitoring him closely. He'll have a drain under his scalp um, for a day or so that will kind of collect any uh, excess you know, fluid or blood. And then um, really it's just supportive recovery that we're going to be dealing with the pain control. So. Uh, yeah, from a fellow standpoint, um, you know, we travel usually from all over the country to be able to train with Dr. Uh, golly get to do these types of cases and they're very rare cases uh, but it gives us the opportunity moving forward wherever we choose to practice or settle down uh, to be able to offer these services potentially to patients in that region of the country that uh, that may need these types of procedures. About 30 years ago this operation had a very high uh, morbidity and potentially mortality rate you know? But just, there's just been so much improvements in the anesthesia and the neurosurgical care and, and everything else that these operations are a lot more, they're a lot safer now, they're a lot more routine. But it happens to be this is a fairly rare condition, even for the craniofacial uh, type of stuff. So. Um, from an anesthesia's perspective, um, I think the fact that it's just such a big case that falls into people um, will have extra. Uh, CRNAs in the in the case, so we'll have two to three uh, people just on the anesthesia side in the, in the room at all times. Where usually, for most cases, we only need one. Um, Dr. Gully, Dr. Troy, I mentioned uh, the, the surgeons plus in special lines, we have extra monitors uh, that we don't typically use for most cases, uh, blood products and transfusions and those kind of needs. It's a lot of stuff involved, so yeah, so definitely some extra things from the anesthesia side as well. Uh, there's not probably more than about 10 centers in, in the world that really do that. I mean, some people say they do cranial facial surgery, but you know, just doing a regular cranial vault or something like that. But when you're talking about this kind of business here where you're moving the actual eye sockets and doing stuff like that and doing moving them three dimensionally, that's, that's a bigger deal. And, and that's uh, uh, not routinely done every single day.